Mm. Hi everybody, hi everybody. I am Christian. Welcome to Lazy Devs Academy and welcome to the future of Pico 8, which is Picotron. That's right. Today's video is going to be a little bit improvised. I don't really have like a script or like a, a, a roadmap happening here. I just want to look at Picotron. I want to give you an overview of what Picotron is. It just came out. We're going to discover it together and see what it can do and how we can make this work. So what is Picotron? Well, Picotron is the third fantasy console by Zep, by Lex Lawful. We had uh, Vexatron at the beginning, then we had our beloved Pico 8, and now we have Picotron. And if you want to think about this as the sequel to Pico 8, as kind of like a Pico, a, a super Pico 8, or, or I don't know, Pico 8 64, or I guess it's Pico 64, it's it could you could think about this as a big Pico 8. Now there's some caveats to that in that it still has limitations and we actually don't really know exactly what the limitations exactly are. We're gonna explore this together. And also that's not exactly correct. There is a slightly different strategy about Picotron and I'm gonna talk about it later. But for now, let's just imagine this is like kind of like a new Pico 8, a more powerful Pico 8. I'm gonna give you a quick start guide for everybody who just wants to jump in and like get their hands dirty. And then we're gonna wind back and start from scratch, okay? Good. Okay, so there is a website, you can visit it and you can launch Picotron in your browser, kind of like the educational version of Pico 8. Um, the own, there are some problems, there are, it is still very much alpha, a lot of functions are not there or turned off or it works not quite the way it will work in the end. It kind of resembles more Pico 8 now than it will be later, I think. You can save things, you can save your programs, but they will not persist. So that's a big danger. So whatever you write, make sure you, you know, copy and paste back up it locally on your PC in like a text file or anything like this, because whatever you save on Picotron won't get saved. You cannot do any graphics work within Picotron right now, and there is just no sound whatsoever. You can import graphics from Pico8 into Picotron, uh, but it's a bit of a convoluted process. We're gonna show you how this works in a second. This is what the website will look like when you boot it up. It's, it's just, there is no boot up sequence or anything. It just launches you straight into the command line, showing you this is Picotron Playground version five or 0 0.5, I guess. Like in Pico 8, just by pressing escape, you can switch the code editor. This is your code editor. And by pressing escape, you can jump back into the command line. The code editor doesn't have much, it's not as complex as the Pico 8 code editor so far. Uh, you, I cannot switch to like different things. There is icons in the top right corner, but it's just, I can switch to the command line. There is no editor, graphics editor, sound editor. As I said, it's just code nothing else it's just for you to get your feet wet with you know with picotron also the tabs don't work i've seen some people manage to create a second and third tab and so forth but they do not work like the tabs work in pico 8 so no tabs now in the command line in here you can uh, you can browse everything like in pico 8 dear the, the Windows version of listing, uh, you know, what files are available is actually doesn't work in Picotron and you can drink whenever I write dear instead of the correct command is ls, list, list, I guess, list. All right, so typing in ls tells us what's on the virtual, the imaginary disk of Picotron. And right now there's a, but a kind of mysterious folder system. We're not gonna go into system. There is a very, very interesting folder, demos. We're actually gonna go through all of the demos. This RAM, uh, which again, is we're gonna talk about this later. We can save something. So if I, if I go save test, it saves my uh, program as test P64. So yes, no longer P8 files, now it's P64 files. But as I said, this will just be saved temporarily. When I close the browser windows, all those files would get wiped. So make sure you make backups. Now, as I said, you can also change to the different directories. You can go CD demos and then do, uh, almost did the deer, but no LS. And then you can see some demos. You can boot them up, for example, let's go load 
uh, playground actually. Playground. There we go. We are right in the code editor and this is the playground uh, source code. It looks very much similar to Pico 8, slightly different font, not just uppercase anymore, but also lowercase and uppercase like in a normal text editor, a lot more space, a lot more spacious. And as always, like in Pico 8, Control uh, R will just run the program. And that is basically kind of like the quick start guide. If you want to start experimenting, just look look at the demos, look at the source code. It looks very much like Pico 8 code. If you know anything about Pico 8, this should seem familiar. And there's some websites that you can might visit to get some additional information. There is the Picotron, uh, kind of like a, a teaser website that was up already for a long time. Uh, there's now a Picotron FAQ button here. This will get you to this rather new Picotron FAQ and this is the button that launches you onto the playground. There is some interesting questions here um, answered. Uh, here's the new color palette we're going to talk about in a second. And here's another link that will launch you in another document, which looks like this. This kind of like is a bit of a, um, um, you know, in-depth information of how drawing things in, Pico, in Picotron works. Again, we're going to step uh, through some of this stuff in a second here. If you want to figure it out yourself, this is a good source. And another good source, obviously, is the uh, thread, the blog post on lexloft.com where Zep posted on uh, the playground and there's lots of really interesting data in uh, the comments section. And that's all you really need to know to get started with the Picotron. So if you want to figure out things yourself, knock yourself out. But of course, I also looked a little bit into this. I'm not very knowledgeable. This is kind of like just like one day of research and experimentation that I prepared here. First of all, let us look at some of the specs. Okay, so I pasted in some information from this little preview teaser website that we had for a long time now, but now it's kind of like a maybe good uh, moment, good place to kind of like discuss what this really is now that we actually have it here and we can see it working, right? Okay, so we have a different resolution than Pico 8. This is a way higher resolution than Pico 8 and it's actually pretty high resolution in general, I would say. It's 480 times 270 with 64 definable colors. These are interesting numbers. This is very interesting stuff. So this is what you see here right now. So uh, 480 two times, uh, times 270, that means we have a 16 by 9 aspect ratio. This would be really good if you want to bring uh, Picotron content to modern displays, modern consoles. Um, the actual pixel numbers are not ideal for that because they do not neatly divide into 720p. Uh, but they do neatly divide into 1080p. So if you want to bring uh, Picotron content to 1080p displays, you just have to scale everything by four. Now, how big is this compared to Pico 8? The height of the screen is just slightly more than two Pico 8 screens. So it's, you, know, you can stack two Pico 8 screens on top of each other. Now, the width of the screen is very wide screen. It's kind of like three and a half, more than three and a half Pico 8 screens. It's kind of like somewhere in the middle there. So three screens and then more than a half. So way wider than Pico 8, but uh, kind of like almost exactly two screens high. In terms of the amount of pixels, it's eight times the amount of pixels in total than Pico 8. Accordingly, we kind of also hope that it has more processing power, although this part is quite not still not figured out, still in development. How does it fare compared to other fantasy consoles? It is uh, four times the amount of pixels than TIC-80. It is kind of like um, all of the resolutions of TIC-80 multiplied by two, which just makes it a very, very different kind of console, a whole different kind of animal. You're not gonna get those chunky pixels unless you really want them. That's also something that I kind of like found interesting. So because the height of the screen is kind of slightly more than twice the height of Pico 8, you can, and that's kind of like one of the aspects here, you can run Pico 8 content, and you will be able to run Pico 8 content in uh, Picotron. And then an obvious thing to do is just to scale Pico 8 content by two. So you will get like a big square in the center of that um, of that um, Picotron screen, and it will have almost no borders on the top and bottom, but it would obviously have very chunky borders on the left and right because it's a very different aspect ratio. Now, something that's also interesting about the resolution, I can't really care about the resolution, so, so hear me out. Something that's really interesting is like, I'm already thinking about the mobile 
uh, devices that run Picotron. And if we can kind of like ignore all the, you know, modern high resolution displays like, you know, like Steam Deck or anything like this, because obviously it will run Picotron, it will be fine, it will look nice because the display is really high resolution. But if you look at the older devices, um, uh, something that's interesting is the 640 by 480 devices, the things that are run Pico 8 really well, that looks really nice and crisp, stuff like the Game Force or the Anbernic, um 351V, like the things that are used in the right now, the, you know, the Pico 8 devices. They actually won't really work with Picotron that well because 640 times 480 doesn't really work that great with a Picotron resolution. What will work really great is the humble uh, Anbernic RG351P, which I own. It's this guy here, right? So this actually has a, a smaller display than 640 times 480. It's a 16 by 9 display. And this is really perfect for um, a Game Boy Advance because it's kind of like twice the resolution of the Game Boy Advance, but it will also kind of like work really well with the Picatron because it's exactly 480 pixels wide. It's slightly taller than Picatron. Uh, so you will have some letterboxing on the top and bottom, but this will be an excellent, this might be an excellent Picotron device. We don't know yet if it has the processing power. It probably has, but you never know. Right, let's talk about some other stuff. So there's some graphics <laughs> buzzwords here, which are interesting. So we have blend tables. What are these? I think I know what these are. They are called differently now, I think. There is fill P, film pattern, which we already know from from uh, Pico 8. And there is T-Line 3D. That's something that we can test out. Uh, sadly, I'm still not equipped to talk about T-Line too much. We're gonna take a look at the demo that does it, but otherwise I will maybe wait until, I don't know, Frederick Sucho does something with this. This some seems like a play toy for him rather than for me. There's also something called stencil clipping, which I do not see an implementation of, I think. But from what I understand, it's kind of like, uh, I talked about the circular circular clipping thing. Uh, I'm assuming that it's something like this, where you can maybe define a bitmap and it will cut out a bitmap, something like this. Uh, again, I didn't see an implementation of this just yet. Now maps, it seems layer grids and free from item placement. There is no map stuff yet in the playground. I haven't seen anything. These things are really only interesting if you can uh, see the, uh, editor for it and we just don't have any editor except from the code editor. There is no audio whatsoever so we're going to skip about this. It's going to be PCM and 64 notes synth so there's going to be a synth but also some kind of generation, sound generation. Now the code is um, Lua 5.4 with Pico 8 compatibility features. Um, yeah from what I've seen so far um, the code that Picatron is running is more close to the real Lua. So far we have been a bit shielded from the real Lua. Uh, this is more in the direction of, of, um, of real Lua, but it's definitely very much similar to Pico 8. And actually a lot of the functions that you already know from Pico 8 will just straight out work in Picatron. Now here's some information about the card data, so how you save things. There's going to be a new format called p64.png. So like with Pico 8, you can save your uh, Picotron card in a PNG. That's great. It's still being continued. Now you can also, uh, but it has some limitations. And apparently the, you can also export an, an unlimited version uh, in a p, uh, .p64 format. There's been also some more information about, you know, uh, where you can play uh, Picotron content. And I, from what I understand, is going to be basically the same thing as with Pico 8, which means you can play it on Windows, Mac, Linux, uh, everything that supports the SDL2 library, which is something that is underneath Pico 8 and also Picotron. And I kind of really like how we get like this alpha version, this preview running in the browser window, which means to me, it's definitely optimized to run uh, in HTML5, which to me was a big feature of, um, of Pico 8 and something that Pico 8 has is really way above other engines. It's kind of like leaves something like Unity in the dust. It just runs so well in the browser. It feels so comfortable running in the browser Pico 8. And it seems like that's also where Picotron is starting. Now let me show you off some uh, some actual um, demos that we have from, from Picotron. So again, LS, I'm gonna go to a CD demos. Mm, 
Ah, there we go. Drink one shot. <laughs> it's, just, it's, just, it's just such a such a reflex now. Okay, so I'm gonna go load. Um, I think one good thing, first thing to try out is spiral.p64. It's a very, very simple code. We're gonna run this. It just looks like this. Really nice demo, just drawing a bunch of circles and wiggling them around a little bit. Now you can see that the code itself is not that difficult. It's just like a for loop uh, drawing basically 150 circles. Well, not 150 circles, but also drawing every second circle only. And then using sine and cosine to wiggle them about. Uh, using the t function, the time function here. Uh, and then just drawing the circle with the normal circ statement. Nothing has changed uh, from uh, Pico 8. Even the Pico 8 colors are here. So 12 is the blue color. And for example, we know our beautiful Pico 8 red is 8. So if I change the color to 8, it will turn red. Beautiful. Okay, change it back to 12. And also to show you the Pico 8 compatibility, I'm just going to select all this code, copy it. I'm gonna run uh, Pico 8, I'm gonna paste the code in Pico 8, I'm gonna run it in here, and sure, the resolution is not the same, like you can see that, you can see, the, you don't see the center of the circles, right? <laughs> because like off to the side here. But you can see it's the same code running, it does basically the same thing as it does in Picotron. Pico 8 is just like a smaller window into the same, uh, same program. Cool, 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 okay, good, let us do uh, another demo. Uh, next one I want to look at is load uh, dots. Okay, so you can see this is a bit more of a longer um, a longer code. Let's first see what it does. Control R. Um, it shows us some data and uh, I have a mouse cursor here and if I start drawing you see uh, some beautiful particle effects happening and I love it. It's so nice. So, so nice. And you can see we have like we have a lot of dots happening here, like 2,100, 2,200 dots. That's a lot of particles happening here, and um, the CPU value is not is like like one third, one fourth, no one th no three fourth. There we go, three fourth full. One point seven five is something that it hits. So yeah, it seems like it's able to run a Bravia advertisement just fine. Uh, Code-wise, it's again, it's nothing that would make you uh, uh, lose your mind. It's just like uh, there's a make actor function, which I think it creates like your particles. Uh, there is your underscore draw function. It uses underscore draw, underscore init, underscore update, things that you're familiar with from Pico 8. Uh, something that I tried but didn't uh, manage to get working is update 60. Underscore update 60 will not work in Picotron at this point in, in, this, in this playground version 0.5. Now, um, there is some things that, that should give us some pause, some new stuff here that I, that's actually interesting. There is a get mouse function. It's not green. So I don't know if it's part of the API or not. There are some functions that are not recognized as part of the API. It's kind of funky, but it is not anywhere here in this code. So I'm assuming get mouse is something that you can do in Picotron. And what it does, it gets some information about the mouse. So MX, MY, and MB, I'm assuming is the button of the mouse. And that also should cue us into something other that is new with Picotron. There is a persistent mouse cursor. Like I didn't have to, like there's no code to display this mouse cursor. The mouse cursor is just always there. Uh, so yeah, it seems like in Picotron, the mouse plays a more important role than it did in Pico 8. Uh, you always will have a mouse and you always have, and you have like some functions apparently um, that allow you to access the mouse more directly and not like using some kind of weird hacks the way it was in Pico 8. Now this is where I want to show you some secret things that we maybe not really supposed to see, but ooh. So I'm gonna press escape and I'm gonna try, type in terminal. What? What is this? What? So this is one of the aspects, I think, from what I understand. This is one of the aspects in which Picotron really differs from Pico 8. This is where Picotron is a very different animal from Pico, from Pico 8. Picotron is not, the way Zep 
uses, uh, the terminology Zep uses, is, is that it is a fantasy workstation. It is not a fancy console, it is a fantasy workstation, which means it has its own desktop thing where you have it can open different windows and have different programs running in parallel in different windows. Right now we open a bunch of terminals. I, th I don't think this works the way it's supposed to work. And up here you can see I think the programs that are running. So previously in Pico 8 these were like different icons that would switch the editor between different modes. Now these are kind of like different programs running. So every mode in Pico 8 is now it's kind of like its own card, its own program. Uh, the programs we are running is like the editor. The editor is also a program or like a card basically. We have this terminal window and then now we don't have that display anymore but you can switch between them using Alt, left and right. So this allows you to switch the, the, between the open programs. Now in this desktop program, it is also a, a program, a card. Mm, and within here then, then we get some more additional programs which are not listed here. So it is still a bit weird and janky and, and I don't think we're really supposed to interact with this layer. It's kind of like just like a preview. And I think general the philosophy of, of uh, Picotron is that it is kind of like a Pico 8, a more elaborate Pico 8 where there is basically no default editor. There is no default graphics editor, nor default uh, map editor, default sound editor. All those editors are not necessarily embedded into Picotron the way they are embedded into Pico 8. You cannot really change the editor in Pico 8, right? It's just like, it's just like a monolithical, inaccessible, you know, set in stone. In Picotron, all of these things exist. Maybe there's like a default version of it existing, but they are all programs, cards made in Picotron. And you can change everything about Picotron by just adding your own modes of the editor, so to speak. You can, for example, something that we did in a community, Johan Pates made a uh, PicoCAD, right? Where you can create 3D uh, objects in Pico 8. Now in Picotron, he could take that and port it to Picotron and you could start making 3D games in Picotron with, with having your own uh, Pico CAD uh, mode in the editor. You could start editing you know, your 3D objects from within Picotron. And I think this is also why we're having multiple windows, being able to maybe you know, edit your code here while doing uh, graphics work or level work at the same time. You can arrange your workspace um, to do whatever it needs to be for your task at hand. And this is gonna be great, I think, uh, when we're gonna see the community coming together and developing the tools. We've seen a lot of interesting tools being developed for Pico 8 already, but this is gonna be something that's more encouraged, kind of like part of the idea in Picotron. Okay, something I wanted to explain um, is um, there is a secret folder or special folder here called RAM. And the idea is that um, basically right now, when you have a P64 file, that's not just like one file anymore. Now this is basically a whole directory of multiple files. You can put multiple files in the same P64 project. And so when you load a P64 project, that project, that directory opens up, it's being mounted basically, and then you can access this directory that is was embedded in the, in the file. And that directory is then saved in, uh, like it's accessible through that RAM folder. So we're gonna uh, go in here, we're gonna go CD RAM, and then we're gonna go LS, and then you can see there's mount, we're gonna go CD mount, and then LS, and there is, some weird, weird characters. These are basically different uh, uh, files, different uh, P64 files that we opened, and they have been provide. They have now like folders now here that we can open and and rumble through. So we're gonna go with CD uh, Zuspert and then ls and there's not a lot here there's just like a lua file here because that's all basically p64 programs consist of at this point later on you might have some more files that have graphics and maybe sound effects and whatever maybe there's multiple lua files right now the main program of the thing that we loaded is just main.lua that's kind of like the source code 
of the program we just loaded. Now there's a trick here that I saw on the in one of the comments section where you can run this uh, Lua file in inside one of those windows and I'm gonna paste it in here. So basically go run underscore program underscore inside underscore terminal, <laughs> open, uh, open bracket, uh, quotation mar uh, uh, marks and then you have to provide a link uh, URL uh, path to uh, to a Lua file. And if you do that, it will run that Lua file within this terminal window. So this is kind of like shows you off what it will look like if you run um, a, uh, a, a Picotron file in a terminal. This is how you how it would look like. Right, let us go, uh, let's look at some more demos because um, you might be at this point thinking like, wait a minute, how do I get graphics in here? Because, okay, sure, I have, um, we can draw graphics, we can draw circles and so forth, but how can we get like real, like, like bitmaps in here? So I'm gonna um, load fill P because this is kind of like, gives you a bit of a glimpse of how graphics work in Pico 2 and they're slightly different than they work in Pico 8. In Pico 8 we had like an embedded built-in sprite sheet that was kind of part of the idea of Pico 8. This is no longer the case. Picotron files don't really have a sprite sheet per se, at least not in this state, maybe it will change later on, but right now we don't really have a sprite sheet. Uh, we can create as many sprites as we want and we can arrange them into sheets or whatever. This is all now something that is in your hands. You are no longer tied to this rigid sprite sheet system. You can now create as many sprite sheets or sprites as you want. I'm assuming as many as you want. You have to think, see later on what the re uh, restriction is going to be, but potentially as many as you want. And this is something that this program does. I'm going to run this real quick so you know. This is kind of like a fill pattern editor. It shows off the fill pattern uh, capabilities. It's just like a very simple drawing tool. And you can see the right, repeating pattern here. Uh, the really the remarkable thing here, uh, one of the most remarkable things here is that the patterns are bigger now. They used to be uh, four times four but now the eight times eight, so four times the size, or like the name dimensions multiplied by two. Uh, so yeah, bigger fill patterns, bigger than before. All right, but what's actually happens here is um, at the beginning here, and this, this is the magic spell. This is where we're gonna create, uh, we're gonna have a variable, and that variable is assigned a new user data. That is user data being created, u8, I'm not exactly sure what U8 means. <laughs> uh, I think it's kind of like a format for a bitmap. Uh, might be a Pico 8 compatible format for a P for a bitmap. Um, or maybe it just means that there's eight bits per pixels. I'm not sure what, what this means. Uh, but then we have eight comma uh, eight, that's the size of the bitmap. So we just created a sprite here. This creates a smart a sprite and puts it on B. B, where the variable B contains now a sprite. Uh, and something you can, for example, do, you can just draw the sprite. It's actually, and that's what is happening down here. We do an SSPR from B. So this is an SSPR. It's kind of similar to Pico 8, but slightly different because in SSPR now we have to first specify what sprite we're drawing, and this is going to be the variable B. That variable B contains the sprite. It's an object. And then um, starting the source coordinates, the upper left corner of the, of the source, um, the width and height, and then the destination coordinates and the width and height of the destination. So we're just taking this little eight times eight bitmap and we make it really large on the coordinates 2020. That's what this code does. And that's basically like this, this left part of, this, of the screen. That's what it does. This draws the, the pattern on the left. But before we get, get there, there is actually some interesting thing that's happening here. Here, do you see this? Set draw target, set draw target. Yeah, so now, and it says set draw target, and then it, it submits B as, as a argument. So what you can do now is you can draw into sprites. Uh, that's something we kind of got at the end of, of Pico 8, where we were able to kind of draw into the sprite sheet. We could like do some poking around in memory and then suddenly sprite sheet is then the screen are flipped. And now when you draw something to the screen, it doesn't draw actually to the screen, it draws to the sprite sheet. <gasps> But this is actually now this functionality, but like 
implemented into the API, like really properly implemented. So now when you say to set draw target, you can, instead of drawing to the screen, you can draw into a bitmap, a sprite that you created. And in this case, we created a tiny sprite. And we said, we're gonna say, we're gonna draw into that sprite. And then we draw a circle into that sprite. And after we draw the circle, we're gonna reset the draw target to the, uh, to the actual screen. And what this code does is create like this tiny little circle. That's all it does. And you can tell, but because if I create, uh, if I make the circle bigger, for example, then you see the circle gets bigger. This is something we do at the very beginning, Just there's just something in the bitmap. Now the rest of the stuff that we have here is kind of like pretty easy. We clear the screen, um, we set we set the fill pattern, we do like the little enlarged version of the, of the uh, of the sprite of the pattern on the left side. This draws horizontal and vertical the grid lines basically. And then this will, um, from what I understand this code here, this uh, scans this little bitmap that we created. This scans this, uh, this little bitmap pixel by pixel and creates a value that is then poked into a certain place to set the fill pattern. For some reason, I'm not sure if this is true, but some for some reason the fill pattern it doesn't quite work yet, so it's, or maybe it, that was more convenient to zap to program. I'm not sure. I haven't actually experimented with the fill pattern myself too much. Uh, but yeah, this is the address where the fill pattern is. So this little code snippet generates, um, you know, the number that needs to be in memory for this fill pattern to be the fill pattern. And then we're gonna get a rect fill. We're gonna fill the, you know, this whole area on the right here with just rectangle and because we set a fill pattern it will use that fill pattern. There is something extra spicy here at the end here which I thought was very interesting. We have this on event thing happening. So apparently there's also an event system in, in Picotron as well. That's something that Pico8 didn't have. So now you can fire a certain uh, function, this function here, uh, whenever uh, the user clicks somewhere. So there is no longer, in Pico 8 you could do it by having like an inside the update function, you would wait for the button to be pressed. But now this is kind of like a listener, like event listener. It's, it's, it's just there and it waits for the click to happen. And when a click happens, no matter what, what's, what is currently being executed, uh, you will get uh, this function being executed now. And this is just for setting the pixels in a little sprite preview. Okay, still not that complex of a program. There, we have some little details here now, there's little user data here. But of course the question is now, can we get some of our own user data in here? Because right now this is like an empty user data and we're drawn into it, but can we import stuff into Picotron? And the answer is yes. So let us just start writing our own fun, uh, our little program. We're gonna go function underscore init. Again, this is stuff that we already know from Pico8, it's fine. So we're gonna do the same thing. Uh, I'm see. I'm used to do the indentation with the space bar, but now that's actually no longer needed because now we have all the space in the world, so we can use the tab, like real people do, like not insane people do. Okay, so we're gonna go uh, B, and then we're gonna go user user data, open parentheses. Now, previously we had like this um, U8 thing, and then we would define this, but now we're gonna do something different. So I put it up Pico 8 just like to grab some sprites. And now this is like some prototype. Uh, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. We're gonna, we're gonna talk about this prototype a lot in the future. Little teaser right there. So I'm gonna take this sprite, which I think is a nice sprite. I'm gonna select, uh, it's not an eight times eight, it's a 16 by 16 sprite, but we kind of want to have something bigger for our experiment. I'm gonna go uh, control copy, copied uh, two times two sprites. Back in Picatron, I'm gonna open up quotation marks. I'm gonna go Control V to paste. This pastes a bunch of text with like square brackets, GFX and everything. Close quotation marks, close brackets. There we go. There we go. Now this 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 pixel data that was encoded into string is then store uh, saved, converted into user data into a sprite that uh, is then saved in the B variable. So now this B variable is our little sprite. And now we can just draw it on the screen. So let's go draw. And then let's go CLS. And then just SPR. 
Now, again, previously you would have a number that is associated with a sprite, like sprite number 12, but now this is Picatron, so there is no sprite sheet, so to speak, but instead we just have B. That's the variable that contains our sprite. And we're gonna draw it like 32, 32. Run. There's a little sprite, there it is. So this is how you can bring data from, um, from Pico 8. There is no easy way to just copy like an entire sprite sheet from Pico 8. You could just select the entire sprite sheet and paste it here probably. But then uh, in order to access all the different sprites in a sprite sheet, you would have to use a complicated SSPR statement to kind of like isolate the sprite that you're talking about. Something that's kind of nice that you can also do is here, instead of saving a sprite in a variable like the B here, something you can also do is set underscore SPR, and then a number, 66, and then the variable containing the user data, which means now this sprite that we have is now the sprite number 66. So instead of sprite B, we can go sprite 66. So this feels more like Pico 8 now, right? Like now we have sprites that have numbers assigned to them and you know, we have sprite one, two, three, and so forth, or 66. If you are not really comfortable with having like objects and so forth, having sprite data in an object, this might be a more familiar way of dealing with sprites. But it still requires the setup here. You cannot just like copy an entire sprite sheet into, uh, into Picotron. Not yet, at least. I'm assuming there's going to be some ways of doing this very quickly. Now let us do some more work here. So we had this, um, I'm going to just copy stuff because I already pre prepared some stuff. We had like this part here where we get the mouse coordinates, MX and MY, and we can use this to move around a little sprite. Why not? So let's go MX um, minus MY minus and this, oops. I'm, I always have like the instinct of saving things, but I mean, I, you, it doesn't really work in, in this environment. So you just have to work, hope that it doesn't crash. Uh, oh, there we go. There's the little spaceship and now we can, it kind of like moves together with our, our, with our mouse cursor. That's nice. But of course we also have FS, SSPR. And again, this works the same way. Um, you have to specify a number of the sprite or actually the variable containing the sprite. Now source coordinates, zero, zero. Source width and height, 16, 16. Uh, destination coordinates, we're gonna keep this around. And then destination size, we, let's, let's scale it up, 32, 32. There we go, we have a nice big little spaceship. And this is kind of like the resolution uh, or the size uh, uh, in which I think most Pico 8 content will look in uh, Picotron. Obviously, Picotron is capable of high resolution, but if you bring over content from P uh, Pico 8, this is what it will look like. Now, I want to start talking about some of the peculiarities of Picotron, which I find very fascinating. And one of the things that I'm quite, quite enamored with are these color tables here that um, Zap talks about. What are color tables? There, they used to be, they used to be palettes, and you could swap colors between palette in a palette and so forth. That's no longer the case. Now we have color tables. So a color table is basically a way when you draw a pixel to the screen, right? A color table is a way to find out what the final col pixel on the screen will be like. And the color tables here take two inputs, which is the color of the pixels you want to be drawing and the color of the pixel you are drawing on top of. And then the result, the entry in that table is the result and that's gonna be what color the pixel ends up being. It, it seems complicated, but um, this allows basically um, like the transparency effects. You, in Pico 8 you could switch to certain colors to be transparent, um, but it also allows switching around palettes and it gives you even more abilities like combining the already existing screen data with the data that you're drawing, combining them in really smart ways. We're gonna see some really good examples in the demo in a, in a second here. But first I just wanted to show you what this looks like. Okay, so here I'm gonna paste it in here. This is a little for next loop that will, <clears throat> it will basically go into a certain address and read whole bunch of numbers from a certain address. That address, and you can read it up in the documentation I, I showed just now, that's the address where the default color table is, right? So we're gonna now see a color table on the screen. This is the color table. 
Now, Picotron has 64 colors. The first 16 colors are the standard PQ8 colors. So, you know, when you're talking just the first 16 colors, this is just straight PQ8. Uh, it, it's a whole spreadsheet, basically, that we're talking about. The column in this spreadsheet, the columns are um, the color of the pixel that you're drawing on top. Whatever was on the screen before you wanted to draw something on the screen. That's the color that's on top. The rows are the color of the pixel that you want to be drawing. And as you can see, like all of the rows are just like one, two, three, like the entire row is one, 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 and two, 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 three, 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 three. That's because when you draw a pixel to the screen, most of the time you just want to see the color that you want to draw. You just want to overwrite whatever was on the screen. And that's what the table looks like when it works like this. Except, except the top row, the very top row, and you can see that it says, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. It's just like the numbers going up from 0, like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That's because that's the color number 0. So if you want to draw a black pixel, that pixel is supposed to be transparent, which means you're not supposed to see anything when you draw a black pixel. That's why this upper row is different from the other rows. That's why this one just has the numbers here, because it will just like the resulting pixel will be whatever was on the screen before. It will just take the color that the pixel had on the screen before, and it will just say like, yeah, keep it like this, you know? And you can start messing around with this. For example, if we're gonna say, palt, so this is the Pico 8 version, the transparent, we're gonna turn the transparency off. Uh, we're gonna uh, make the black color no longer transparent. So now you can see there is a black border around our sprite and you can see the top row now is just all zeros because now the color number zero is no longer transparent. Now it will just overwrite whatever was on the screen with zero. Whatever, no matter what color is underneath, it will just get overwritten with zeros. And now we can, you know, take something, we can make 12 transparent, for example. And you can see now 12 is transparent. And you can, if you look at the row number 12, here it is, it just repeats the numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Because again, if something's transparent, it will just take whatever was on, whatever color was on the screen before and just like puts this into the result. And all the palette swaps and everything, they work exactly the same thing. So if you want 12 to become eight, right? Now the cockpit is red and you can see in the row number 12, instead of, you would expect like this is 10, 10, 10, 10, 11, 11, 11, you would expect now to be 12, but now we replace it with eights. So all of the standard PQ8 functions work with this table. All of the functionality of the standard PQ8 palette functions are uh, some things that you can do with this table, but this table can do a lot more now. So I created a little, little have a function here that, that kind of like shows us a little bit what's what's up. I'm, I'm calling it Paltron. I'm pretty sure some kind of version of this will be available in the, in the API in the end with Picotron. But the idea is that it just takes, you know, it just um, changes a single entry in this table. Uh, basically row, column, and, and the entry actually in the table. So let's mess around with things. Uh, let's go um, Paltron. So let's say, let's say the pixel I'm, go, I'm drawing on top of is red. Let's say that I'm drawing on top of a red pixel. There's a red pixel already on the screen and I'm drawing something on top. And let's say the thing I'm drawing, I want to be drawing is a blue pixel, 12. What should be the resulting pixel? Well, now I can decide, decide what it should be. Let's say in this case, I want the pixel to remain red. So now you can see something weird happen, something that is kind of difficult to do in PQ8. You can see the red letters shining through the blue part of the cockpit. I hope you can see this. The, blue, the red pixels, the red letters are shining only through the blue part and nothing else. Only through the blue part. Okay? Maybe it's a bit, gets a bit clearer if we do a little of a bit of a rect fill. So we're gonna do here and you can see now the, the cockpit becomes red if I move it on, on top of the red of the rect rectangle, right? It becomes red here. And otherwise it, it stays blue, except there's a, there's a red letter here. So we can like combine colors that are already on the screen 
with whatever we draw on top of the screen. Crazy stuff. And of course, it doesn't have to stay eight. We can change it to something else. Let's change it to two. All right, so now the cockpit turns uh, into this deep uh, dark red color whenever we draw blue on top of red. Okay, so this is how you get pixel data in Picotron and how you can manipulate the new color table function to do funky new effects. And I'm sure we're gonna get a lot of experience with this. Something you can very easily set up with this is something, for example, let's say you have a platformer and, and you have an underwater section, right? And then, you know, your character is, let's say, red and jumps into green water. Then you can change the entire color palette of the character without having to, you know, do any kind of lookup if there's, they're in the water or not. You can just define the color table so that whenever we draw your character in green water, it will have a different color palette. Something we haven't even discussed yet, I should have maybe talked about this earlier, is the color palette that we have right now. I have a little thing that I can just copy and paste real quick. I'm not gonna walk you through this because it's like really simple. We just have two four next loops and we're just drawing a bunch of rectangles on the screen and putting them in different colors just to see the color palette. Uh, and here we have the color palette of Picotron. So as um, we saw previously, 64 colors, that's a lot of colors. We went from 16 colors to now 64 colors, a big step. Um, and also there's some interesting things happening. So first of all, yes, we have 64 colors, but half of the colors are black. In fact, they are black. Uh, I mean, you cannot really see this, but I'm gonna set it, uh, you know, the background to blue and now we can see, yeah, they're just like literally black boxes. The first 16 colors are literally the Pico 8 color palette, so that's nice. It gives us a bit of a compatibility thing with Pico 8 and it's, it's familiar grounds to us. But now, then starting with 16, the second 16 colors are weird. Some of them are Pico Alt colors, Pico, the secret color palette. I feel like the lime seems familiar. I feel like the red and this yellow, bright yellow color, this seems definitely very familiar. But there's also very unfamiliar colors, like the, the, all the purples here and this purple, this is very unfamiliar territory. This is not, a, not at all what we have in the alternate color palette. So like the, it's kind of like inspired by Pico 8, but not really. And I kind of really like the colors here. I really like the, sec you know, the, especially the purples are really sweet. And yeah, this is, I wish this was the actual secondary Pico 8 color palette. And the fact that the, you know, the second half of the color palette is basically blank is also interesting. I'm assuming the idea here is that it's left intentionally blank. So maybe it encourages people if they want to have some special colors and it encourages people to put the colors in here and not to mess around too much with the standard color palette because obviously uh, there's gonna be editors and so forth um, and other programs that will um, depend on those colors being where they are. And so when, um, so yeah, you know, different programs don't step on each other's toes too much. And we're gonna see how this works maybe in a second. And something that's also very important to uh, keep in mind is that we are not married to those colors. We can change those colors out by any kind of RGB value that you can come up with. You can completely redefine this color palette. And we're gonna see how that works in a second, but first let us look at some additional demos. Okay, let's look at uh, Playground. So this uses the thing that I showed you. It copies some kind of uh, sprite over from Pico 8. Uh, something that interesting that it does here is apparently you can um, use this function here, user data at ribs. Uh, to get the width and height of, of a sprite inside a variable. So that's something that you can do here as well. Otherwise, it does a lot of very interesting things, but nothing really specific to Picotron. All this stuff could potentially also run in Pico 8. So let's run this. This is this thing. Looks really beautiful, really nice logo really animation. Um, and um, it uses the pixel data um, to draw the text. So the text is basically just the bitmap copied over from Pico 8 and then using this bitmap it generates the little circles and then animates them using probably some kind of form of sine and cosine. <laughs> All right, let us look at the next one because that's actually, um, uh, that's actually a very interesting one. This is called lines. Let's look at this. Ooh. Ooh. Wow. This is, this is a very, very interesting program. There's a couple of very interesting things happening. I'm not gonna walk you through, you know, I'm not gonna recreate this, but 
First of all, something it does here is set up a display palette. So what it does, it creates its own colors. It fills the entire um, palette with its own custom colors. And we can see this in work. So this is um, this is um, this is my little code that shows me an entire palette. These are standard colors. We already seen this before. Now we're gonna create a little function in it, and we're gonna paste in the code from that little program that we just had. We're gonna run this now. As you can see, we have a completely different color palette now. So we replaced their standard color palette with kind of like a gradient going from dark into white, and then the rest is just white. But then it goes one step further. So this is back in lines.p64. So it uses color tables, the color tables that we just manipulated. You remember we had like a spaceship with a cockpit and so forth. So it uses this function because look, this is the draw function. This is where actually the lines are being drawn on top of each other. You can see there's a bit of a, there's some parts that are really white and some parts are just like this mellow blue. Um, so you could you would think that it's drawing different pixels on the screen, but it's not. All it ever draws is the pixel color number seven. It just draws seven on the screen. So how do we end up with different shades of blue on the screen if it just draws always the same color? Well, that is accomplished using the color tables. So the color tables are set up so that when you draw seven, you know, uh, whatever was, like if it draws seven and there was a black pixel, it gets slightly brighter. And if that slightly brighter color is there and you draw again seven on top, it gets even more brighter. So you get like this added transparency effect where, you know, the, the, it gets, as you draw, it get, the pixels get slightly brighter. You get that effect using this custom color palette in combination with the color tables. And it's really neat because when you draw, you don't have to care about you know, all those things. You can offload all this processing about figuring out what color to draw so make, to make it look nice and so forth. You can offload all this to the color tables and the color palette. Nice. That's actually the, the thing that made me go like, oh, yeah, this is going to be, that's, that's a very powerful tool. It's a bit complicated. It can, can be even bit difficult to wrap your head around. But if you start thinking with color tables, then there's, you can do a lot of cool stuff. Oh, there we go, another deer. Ah, okay, load skull. Uh, this is the next one. Uh, this is something that you should be very familiar with. Obviously, no problem. Uh, we had that in Pico 8 as well. Now it's running in Picotron. Something that gives me a bit pause is that this is really hitting the edge of the processing power of Picotron right now. And again, we don't know if the CPU uh, that Picotron uses right now is and it's, you know, it's it's gonna be the final version or if it's gonna be tweaked or so, but right, you can see that the CPU is being pretty maxed out with this animation. On the other hand, we do are drawing a lot of circles to make this happen. So again, I'm not I'm not sure if I can really walk you through this because I'm not like there's some rotation, 3D rotation happening here, which I'm not that keen of figuring out what they do. Uh, what I did find out is that um, we are drawing the same circles six times. So that all that whole entire area of circles that uh, consists of the, of the skull, that is being drawn six times on top of each other. And we use a similar effect that we had previously in this, in this lines uh, P64. We use a similar effect to kind of like make um, the different um, circles kind of like add up on each other. So we can like drop this uh, this for loop to zero to zero. So just draw one set of circles, and as you can see it's just it's just it's just basically invisible. Like you can see it in a shadow, you can see some circles, but otherwise it's invisible. Draw two sets of circles, three sets of circles, and now you start getting some of the circles in here. And the idea is that you draw the circles on top of each other and slightly offset, and that's how you get like this chromatic aberration effect, where you, you know it looks a bit rainbowy on the edges. That's 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 the idea here. Uh, so yeah, so this is the full effect. Um, the way it achieves this, however, is a bit odd, and this relates to a different function that I still haven't wrapped my head around. It's this here, uh, I think. It's this masks thing. That you have masks. There are masks. There's a read mask, a write mask, and a target mask. And these masks restrict which bits of a pixel can be changed through an operation. 
And using this kind of like mask, you can make it so that when you draw the same color, it will not change all of the bits, but only some bits. Uh, that kind of like eludes my brain. I would have to experiment with this a little bit more. Here's where we are changing the right mask. And that means that we are restricting which bits of the pixel that we are writing into the, sp into the screen, which of the bits are actually being written into the screen. But yeah, if binary is your second language, then knock yourself out. This Lul uses some kind of mask solution here to kind of like manipulate only the pixel data only partially. And then it repeats the, the process multiple times. So you get like eventually the entire pixel gets manipulated, something like this. Ugh. Something that is interesting here is that uh, there is this here, this thing here, scan lines. It's, if, you, if you can look, it, it has like the scan line effect, right? You can see that there's a scanline effect happening and that's just like this part here. And yeah, if you look at the map here, uh, where is it? Ah, there we go. Pair scanline RGB display palette selection. So you can use a different palette uh, for different scan lines, for different rows of pixels. And that's how the scanline effect is being achieved. But I, at least I think that's how it gets achieved. It's, it is... It is exciting to discover all these things here. And I really hope that this is some of these things are not just gonna stay uh, like addresses that you'd write into the, uh, that some of these things um, get actually exposed to you using some kind of function. Uh, that would be nice. Maybe not, I'm not really expecting this maybe from happening from the scan lines, but I would definitely expect that from happening from the color table because they seem to be so core to the experience. All right, and now we're gonna load up the last demo, and this is gonna be really nice. Yep, we have 3D happening, and you can use the key, uh, cursor keys to run around here. This is basically, we can make definitely some kind of form of Mario Kart happening. And the way we can do this is using with the thing that was teased a little bit before, T-Line 3D. Where is it? Where are we actually T-Lining? There we go, T-Line 3D. Again, hasn't turned green, but again, I'm assuming that this is because it's a kind of like a preview version. I'm gonna be honest here, I have no idea what it does. If from what I understood is that it's not actually, you're not actually creating 3D data or anything like this. It just draws a line between two points like T-Line was. The only difference here is that it gives you some ability to uh, correct the texture along the line. So you can get more accurate perspective correct mapping of a texture on a line and that makes certain math more efficient and, and, and easier to pull off. But honestly, I would have to experiment with this myself and, and probably like a better person to ask how this works is gonna be Frederick Sucho. But maybe when the dust has settled, we're gonna come back to this and discover the secrets of T-Line 3D. Right, I wanted to show you one more thing. So on the Discord, on Pico8 Discord, there's like a channel for Picotron experimentation. People are trying to dig it, dig into it, find out, you know, the secrets and everything. This is um, a really cool quote by Pancelor. Um, he posted this, <coughs> they posted this on, on the channel and this is a really cool quote. I'm gonna copy this. I'm gonna paste it here, run. So what this does is actually show you all of the functions of Pico, uh, Picotron. These are all of the functions, just straight up all of the functions, a list of all of the available functions and some things you can kind of like figure out and like, like guess what they do by just looking at the names. VecMT, it seems like there are vectors. You can do some vector math in in, in uh, Picotron. That seems cool. What is P call? I'm not really sure. There's cool stuff in here, and if you really want to dig into Picotron and to get get like a some juicy juicy uh, takes, this is a good place to do some research. As you can see, I run uh, the skull in a terminal window, and you can see it starts drawing. Uh, scan lines on top of other windows and also messes up the colors. So you can see this is what it looks like once the different cards start interacting with each other. And that's, from what I understand, that's kind of partially intended. Yeah, this is it. This is um, 
Yeah, it just came out. We are experimenting with this. It's not meant to be any kind of final thing. It's just like a sneak preview. It's kind of like a taste of, of the things that are to come. This is something that um, Zep is currently working on. From what I understand, the plan is that we first are gonna see Pico 8 version 1.0 before we're gonna see any major releases in terms of Picotron. And obviously a lot of people from the community are very excited about this. Something I often get asked when people are approach Pico 8, first coming to Pico 8 is like, oh, Pico 8 is nice, but what is the next step? Like once I explore Pico 8, what are my options to moving on? And previously things to move on from Pico 8 were things like Tick 80 or Lua Love, but now there is like an in-house place to move on from Pico 8 if you want to do something bigger. That's kind of like I feel one of the big advantages of Picotron to have a bigger space to explore bigger ideas if you feel uh, Pico 8 too stifling. But also something I really like about it is that it carries kind of like its own philosophy. Like, like there's this idea of creating your own tools to create the thing that you want to create. Having more of a say or in how you want to work on something, not just, um, you know, using the tools that are given to you. And there's a nice thing of, of you know, creating, using Picotron to create tools for Picotron. So you can use Picotron and your tools to create something else like this, like this recursive thing happening. And I'm just like really excited to see where it goes. But you guys let me know what you think about this. Is Picotron something that you are going to check out or are you going to stay with Pico8? And if you took a look at uh, Picotron at the playground, is there anything in the playground that struck out to you? Is there anything you want me to focus more in the future, to talk about more in the future? Let me know in the comment section. Otherwise, see you next time around, guys. Bye-bye.